All right, so the deepest void in the case is pretty much right in front of the cartridge slot, right in this area here. So that's actually where I want this uh, to live. Now, the bottom has to be insulated from all these contacts. They do make uh, epoxy uh, coverings that you can cover your circuit boards with, but I'm just going to use some electrical tape and uh, insulate the bottom of this so this can sit down right about here. Now, you can also um, hot glue this sucker down right into place. Um, and go from there. So what I'm going to do is hook up, show you where to hook up the uh, the inputs for the the video first, and then we can worry about um, changing and overclocking this. Now, so right now, like I said, right about here is where we want to be, um, and my voltage regulators are over here. So my power lines for this are going to go in that direction, and here is. Um, where my video signals originate from so we want our inputs to go in there and our outputs to go out the back so I'm gonna just route wires and trim these back to be able to get to where I need to be okay so now we need to solder our inputs into our new um, S video amp and we want to find the um, CX411A chip here you see this chip here and we need to solder our uh, inputs to two pins on this chip. Um, we're going to be going, the, the chroma amp is going to be going to pin 15 and the Luma amp is going to go um, to pin 16. So you can see there's a number 1 down here, there's a number 12 over here, there's a number 13 right up there. Of how well that shows up and then there's a number 24 over here so that's those are the pins we just need to count so we're looking for 15 so here's 13 14 15 so there's 15 there and there's 16 next to it so we need to solder into those pins now you can do it from the bottom of the board but um, there's a lot of stuff around here and these pins are really really close together so um, if you're using thicker wire, you might not be able to get it in there without hitting one of these other pins. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder right to the actual legs of it from the top here, right onto that. So um, it, it's good to have a decent soldering iron with a kind of a smaller pointier tip to get in there with it. So we're going to do, what I say, chroma is going to 15. So uh, there's 13. 14, 15, so the third one in. And it's kind of blocking the way. I have to get directly on it. Let me see if I can get it from this angle to show you a little bit better. There it is. There's one there. Nicely connected. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Just double checking, and the Luma amp here. Just cut this a little back. I'm sorry if this goes in and out on focus, but I have it in auto focus. So, same, same idea here. Close. Of course, the pins have to be right next to each other. Want to make it easy on you? Okay, we got some solder on there. And there she be. Alright, so my inputs are in there and we'll just lay these wires down, kind of form them around everything. You can see right there. And it's going to power up the, the board here, or give it power. And you can see there are two voltage regulators over here. Now, 
You can see they're numbered one, two, and three, each leg. Number one is voltage input, which is we don't want. Number two is voltage output, which is what we want. And number three is ground. But that third leg, if you if you look at the way it goes, it, it's basically the whole back of this this heat sink, this little tap. That is the third um, leg there. So what you can do is you can either solder directly to this leg, or there's actually a screw that goes through here into the heat sink. You can actually loop it around the ground around that screw if you want. But we need to go um, from number two. We need we need our power from, and it doesn't matter which one you use. It it doesn't make a difference. You can use either one. So I'll just pick one and use it. But you want to come in between the wires. Come in between them because the heat sink. You can see that when this slides on, these two sides touch. Okay, just like that. So you want to come in the middle where this gap is. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get the wires in there. And I'm just bending a tiny little hook in there just to make it easier on myself. And I can actually hook that leg right there. And we'll just solder that in place. Okay. So the board power is gone. It is all connected. So now um, we need to, I'll zoom out and then um, I'll show you how we're going to overclock this. Okay, so here's the thing. Under here, right here, is the original clock, which is, uh, what did I say, 7.6 megahertz. And here's our new one, which is 9.2 or 9.3 megahertz. Okay. Now the clock output from this gets sent to this chip and basically tells the speed that this CPU here is going to run at. So what we want to do is we want to connect our new clock to this chip. Now we have to sever the old clock. If you have this hooked up to a Sega CD, the Sega CD will only recognize the processor if it's running at the original 7.6 megahertz. It will not recognize it if you have it overclocked. So if you want your Genesis to be able to hook up to a Sega CD, you have to have a way of switching back and forth between the original clock and the overclock. So what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect the clock here. There's a trace that goes from that the clock output into the input leg of this. We're going to sever that trace, okay? Then we're going to take this leg here, the, the, the clock input leg, and we're going to wire that to a toggle switch, which I have, um, which I have right here. And this is a single pole, double throw, on and on switch. So in other words, that center leg here is common. One le one one way will switch one leg. One way will switch the other leg. Okay. So what we want to do is hook up the clock input uh, tab on this CPU to the center of this switch. And then we're going to hook up the old clock to one side and the new clock to the other. So that way there we can toggle back and forth between the original speed and the overclock. So if we want to use the Sega CD, we'll switch it back to the original clock. We want to overclock it. We're doing normal play, just playing Sega Genesis games. We'll click it over and we'll run it off the, uh, the overclock speed. Okay. So let me get in as close as I can to this to show you the traces that we have to sever or the, the trace that we have to sever. Okay, so here's the, the brains of the operation. This is the Motorola 6800 CPU that the Genesis used, or the Model 1 used. There were some other different variations of this, which is why, I, like I said, I chose the original Model 1 that says high definition graphics. Some of the other ones use a different chip. I don't know if those are overclockable or not, but I know this one is. All right, so you can see the little the little dot here and also the, the number one. So that's our first tab. So our clock input is tab 15. So 15 tabs over is our clock input. And you can see right here, here's, here's the, the, the leg of the chip, and then here's a trace on the board. So what we have to do is very, very carefully is sever, completely sever that trace into this leg. Um, that disconnects the original clock from this, um, this CPU here. 
So you have to be very, very careful. You can see how close everything is in there. I like to use, I, I, the way I did it before is just use a really sharp number 11 X-Acto blade and just kind of dig it out of there. Um, you could probably get a really small drill bit and do a tube. The only problem is you have a chance of wandering over and nicking one of the other ones. Um, it, it's very easy to break your Sega Genesis this way, so if you're not comfortable with it, don't do it. Um, so you can se sever this leg here and to check to make sure you have it completely severed, put a cartridge in there, hook it up to your TV and see if it, see if it uh, comes on, see if it posts. If it doesn't, if it just sits there with a blank screen, then you've severed that trace completely. Like I said though, be very, very careful. You can see how close everything is in there. I'm not going to do it on camera because I've got to be down, I want to be hovered over it really close and all you're going to see is the back of my head. Um, but I'll dig that out and we'll come back and show you what it looks like. Okay, you can see that I got that trace uh, severed right there. So you just dig it out very gently. You're going to scrape the coating off the board. You're going to come down to copper and you want to dig that, cop that little copper trace out and sever it completely. So I got just that and I didn't nick any of this other stuff and I didn't nick any of the coating on the top. So that is completely severed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of wire and just uh, extend it off of this uh, this leg right here and that'll be going to our center switch now what I also want to do is come off of the uh, original clock right here which you can see the dot here in that little uh, squared off corner so voltage in is over here the clock peg is down here what I'm going to do is come off the underside of this board where that clock is, which is looking at it upside down. So it's this leg right here, right there. And I'm going to extend another wire off to the back. And that'll be go to one side of our switch that'll um, be able to switch us back and forth. And then this one here off of the new clock will go to the other side of the switch. Okay, so what I said was just wrong to get... <laughs> You don't want to go directly off the clock because uh, it, the, the clock that's on here, the oscillator is actually too fast. You have to pull off of the cartridge slot. So if you are looking at the back of the system, it's the row farthest away from you, number 14 from the right is the pin that you want. So that you can switch it back and forth. So. You see this one here with looks like a kind of like a T here on the traces. It'll be the terminal diagonally to the right of that. So that is the one that we want to hook one side of our switch up to. So Okay, as you can see, we got a little bit of uh, spaghetti going here, but I know where everything goes. I routed everything up and under the board. There's only a few places you can actually come up behind the board without squishing against anything. So, you can see why I chose one of those micro switches. It's because actually in the back of the Genesis, there is a hollow right here. And it fits perfectly in that. So... Our clocks are going to be hooked up to either side of this, and then our CPU is going to be hooked up to the center. Here are our two uh, S-Video uh, amplified circuits that are going to go to our S-Video jack. Oh. Right here is right audio. Right, I'm sorry, right here is left audio, right here is right audio, and right here is the ground for those, those jacks on the rear. So that's how we're going to do this. So right now I'm going to mark out the case and we'll set up to drill that. So okay, so here's the top panel. Put a piece of blue painter's tape on there so we can mark it out. And I uh, just did it with a, uh, with a scale. So I got um, from this bottom face, this bottom part up is a half an inch. From this cur start of the curve, that sharp edge there, over is one inch. So that'll be my first RCA jack. And then between each of the RCA jacks is three quarters of an inch. So between here and here is three quarters of an inch. Here and here is three quarters of an inch. 
and from the last RCA jack to where the S video jack will be is one inch. So our RCA jacks look like this, and uh, this is a quarter inch stub on the end, so I'm going to drill quarter inch holes here, here, and here. And uh, this S video here, I just measured it, it is actually slightly larger than half inch, so we're going to go in with a half an inch, and hopefully that'll... Uh, that'll make this fit. If, if it does not, you don't want to, when you do plastic, uh, especially like this where it could be old and brittle, um, first of all you want to go really slow and you want to use the correct size drill bit. Make it, it, it through in one shot. If you try to step it up, if you try to go with a smaller drill and then ream it out with a larger drill, what will happen is, is it'll go fine but then when it breaks through the drill will grab the two edges that you broke through and this will spiral up the drill bit and you'll end up cracking the case real easy. So you want to go with the right size drill bit right through uh, with it. So if I do need to um, round this out a little bit. We're not going to use a drill bit to do it. What I'll do is I'll just take a, um, a piece of sandpaper, wrap it around the drill bit, and just ream it out just a hair. Okay, so I got enough clearance to get everything in there, and we're just going to do it by hand. What I'll do is I'll eyeball it vertically, and then just go into it. This part is so thin that even if we're off a little bit, it's not really going to make that much of a difference. Plus, this is curved, so when we tighten everything down, it's going to want to follow that curve. I did just center drill them real quick, just so that the drill doesn't wander all over the place, and make sure we are where we want to be. Again, just going nice and slow. I can feel it wanting to break through, the tips through, I just don't want those flutes to grab. And we're completely through. Now I'm going to go get one of the jacks and just make sure it does fit in there. Okay, our RCA jacks fit in there nice and snug, so we'll drill the other three. Okay, so we have everything mounted, and uh, the plastic was a little too thick to get the uh, the nut on the S video jack. So um, all I did was epoxy it in place, and as you can see here, it's nice and flush with the outside edge, and that's what she looks like. So now on the inside here, let me zoom you in. Here are the RCA jacks. You can see here's where your wires would hook up to, and then these tabs right here are just bent out, and those are your ground. So we're going to loop those together and put them right to the ground. <clears throat> On the S video, the pins are numbered one, two, three, and four. So one and two are your grounds. Um, three here is the uh, Luma and four is the Chroma. So if you can see on the inside here, <clears throat> all I did was bent those two, you don't have to worry about this outside jacket. All I did was bend these two um, tabs, the two grounds into touch and uh, we can solder our ground wire right onto that and I'll bring that directly out to a ground. I, I just, I don't want to loop it, but the ground between uh, the RCA side just in case there's any kind of interference with them. I don't think there should be, but I'll just put a ground directly from here uh, directly to one of the uh, 
the uh, power regulators. So that way we have a nice ground uh, directly out there and we're not looping between the RCA jacks. Um, just in case there is a little bit of um, interference between them for any reason. So that's how we're going to do it. And then these three here grounds will be looped together and we'll put it in place. Now one thing about the switch that we're going to put in here. The way I'm going to do it, you see it's mounted here. Whatever way this toggle is facing, the opposite two contacts are closed. So if it's facing this way, um, we're closed between the center and this tab. If we're facing this way, it's closed between the center and this tab. So what I, what I want to do is I'm going to put the, um, the, the clock input from the, the CPU here, we're going to put right on the center. And then this tab on, on, on this side here, I'm going to put to the original clock and then this tab I'm going to put to the new clock so that way there when you toggle the switch over pointing it over towards the old stuff then that's the original clock toggle it over to the, our new stuff that we just installed and then that'll be the the, uh, the over clock so that's how we're going to do it so I'm going to go and start soldering these things in off camera just because it's just a bunch of solder joints and then we'll uh, put it all together and we'll see the difference between everything okay we have everything connected you can see it uh, doesn't look as much all over the place and like spaghetti as it was before. Um, everything's routed to where it needs to be so we're not blocking any screw holes. Uh, everything is connected back here. The hardest part is connecting this because those straight pins are a pain in the ass. So usually you just tin them and then uh, as you get the wire in, heat it up, remelt the solder, stick the wire in and it should flow right around the wire. Um, so everything is pretty much in place. Now, the shield that was on this, this here, um, I mean, if you wanted to cut it, cut it out to fit uh, the switch and everything, you can put it back. But all you, this is just a a. Um, uh, just, just, just a, a shield, an RF, RF shield. Really don't need it, um, so we're just going to leave it off. Like I said, if you really wanted to, you could. Uh, as far as RF interference, you, we're not even using the RF signal here, and whatever this is generating, none of your normal stuff uses uh, RF signals anymore. So, uh, as far as TVs go, so you shouldn't be have any interference issues. And uh, now we can just kind of get this case back together again. If you wanted to, um, you could replace the LED with a different color uh, if you want, so feel like it. I'm just going to leave it as is, as it doesn't really bother me. We do want to make sure we rehook it though. Okay, so there she is. I actually did end up replacing the LED because uh, when I tried to put the clip back on, I broke the legs off. So I had another red one in my stash. I just threw that in there. So you can see Here's our, our uh, stereo, composite, S-video, and our toggle. So that way is original clock, that way is the new clock. And uh, now it's just to test it out. So first I'm going to show you the difference between what the RF looks like, what the composite looks like, and then what the S-video looks like. Uh, Okay, I got the lights turned down low in here and we're focused on the TV as best we can just to keep the glare down. So now first things first, we're going to try uh, the original RF. I chose a kind of colorful game. So you can see a few lines, it doesn't look very washed out. That doesn't look too bad. You can see the lines extended from the Sega symbol. Alright, you can kind of hear that interference, you can hear a little buzz and you can see wavy lines. Okay, you can see the wavy lines throughout here. Sound is slightly muffled and it's just a little bit washed out. Alright, so now we're going to switch over and we're going to do the composite video. Okay, this next is going to be composite video with stereo sound. Okay, see it's a little bit more crisp, it's still slightly round and washed out around the very edges, especially white on the black background. But you can see those artifacts are gone, 
the wavy lines are gone. You can especially see it there. No wavy lines, everything looks pretty nice there. Sounds a little bit more crisp. And everything just looks a little bit brighter. Okay, so now we're gonna put on the S video and, uh, and see what the difference is. But there's one thing I wanted to show you. Because we took the stereo, let me turn on the lights here. Because we took the stereo from the headphone jack, this slider actually now controls the volume. So you have to be aware of that. That has to be all the way up. Okay, so now this is S video. So you can see it's very crisp around the letters. It's not washed out around the letters, even on, even with a white on a black background. You can actually see, make out the individual pixels in the, in the Sega sign. Same thing in the Konami sign. You can see the individual pixels in there. So the composite seemed to round the edges more. This one you can make out the jagged edges of the pixels, but it's way, very, very crisp. And whereas before where this look, they all look the same color, this, this here in his face, now you can definitely see the separation of colors. Okay, so that's it. Everything works. Um, it was it's really hard for me to get a picture of the slowdown. Uh, it just doesn't, the camera doesn't kind of pick it up as much as your eye does. Um, so you'll just have to take my word on that. Um, the good thing about this mod is the same exact circuit that we did for to add um, the S video can be done on a Sega Master System, which is the precursor to this. And that can also be done. Um, you can also add the um, audio and composite video jacks too. Now the way you do that on the master system is this has the same port and you just take the mono signal from this and split it between um, left, your left and right. And then uh, you take your video signal from this same, uh, same adapter here as we did and the S video the same exact chip exists inside the master system so you can do the S video mod too. You can't overclock it but you can do all the visual stuff to it. So like I said just a different video um, kinda hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, we'll see you on the next video.